Welcome back, everyone. I guess my alternate is outside, and if I let him in, then he'll know my fear and drive me insane until I kill myself uh, using psychological supernatural warfare. Uh, now, to some of you, that's probably a very confusing sentence, and it's not like I have anywhere else to go, so I might as well sit here and explain. It's been a long time since I covered an analog horror series on the channel, and there are quite a few reasons why. Firstly, I felt like a lot of the series were beginning to be very samey. They were still high quality and interesting, but once you've seen enough of them, you start to feel like they're all mixing together, and it's hard to really be scared by them anymore. The other reason is that I felt like I didn't have anything else to say about them. The format of my videos was changing to be longer form, and I couldn't easily find enough to say about all these series. Probably some otherworldly monsters, probably some government interference or something. I, I don't know. Again, it's all very much the same. This is not a judgment on any series in particular, but more on the state of the genre. But I started seeing suggestions for the Mandela catalog pop up more and more, and decided to dip my toes back into the world of analog horror. Now, I'm not going to do it the old way, the way I used to, where I would go video by video and try and explain the story. If you want something like that, you can go watch Wendigoon's video. I want to talk about what I think is a much more interesting aspect, the artistic presentation. Now sure, the Mandela Catalogs is filled with tropes and cliches, but there's a lot of interesting things that it does too, and the way it subverts or follows through with some of these tropes is really interesting. So. Let's talk about that. Disclaimer. For these first few sections, I will be discussing videos 1 to 5, as they were the videos out at the time I started writing and have been the main topic of discussion for most of the discourse around the Mandela Catalog for the past few months. At the end, I'll talk about the newest video, Exhibition, and my thoughts on that. So understand that some of the criticisms I have may not apply to the newest video, but that's because that's not where those criticisms are pointed. With that out of the way, enjoy. The Mandela Catalog's relationship with, you know, horror imagery is an interesting one. It's filled with tropes and cliches, and I have some criticisms for that, but it also has a lot of really interesting things going on for it. And the first thing I'd like to talk about is its use of religious imagery. Analog horror as a genre is no stranger to the use of religious iconography or reference. Almost any analog horror series about eldritch beings or aliens or what have you includes generic sentences like, God abandon us or something. At times, the use of religious allusions can almost seem like a cop-out being used so frequently and much of the time the religious themes tie into nothing other than building the atmosphere. But the Mandela Catalog does a lot more here, and I think it earns its use of religious themes. One of the biggest reasons for this being it actually ties directly into the story itself. If Wendigoon is correct in his interpretation, this story is at least in some way a narrative about the actual Antichrist, or Satan, or an Antichrist, Satan-like figure taking over the world. But aside from just the story implications, it actually uses the religious imagery and aspects in a unique way. For instance, the first video uploaded to the Mandela Catalog's channel, Overthrown. This actually targets imagery specifically to religion culturally. The entire thing is a perverted and modified old religious cartoon. So especially to people raised or currently religious, it actually pinpoints something specific to an experience. It doesn't just throw some upside down crosses in there or some God has abandoned us quotes in there and call it a day. It finds unique and interesting media and iconography to reference that is specific to the religious theme and explores it in an interesting way. It goes all the way, even making one of the most iconic antagonist figures of the series be a distorted image of what I believe is the big man Jesus Christ himself. And when the actual religious aspects aren't integral to a specific scene, it doesn't shoehorn spooky religious imagery in. There aren't pentagrams on the walls or whatever. It actually does some really unique things aside from the classic satanic tropes. I think that's one of its biggest strengths. It tells a story about inverted religion, Satan-like figures, stuff we've seen before, but with a unique approach. It doesn't use images of the devil, upside down crosses, stuff we commonly associate with the satanic. It's actually taking a unique approach to evil religious forces that is really cool when a lot of satanic or blasphemous horror has overused things like pentagrams to the point of almost parody. But the Mandela Catalog has a unique approach that is refreshing. Unfortunately, once we move away from the religious imagery, that's when things start to be a little more mixed. It's clear that Alex is making the series coming from a place of being a fan of the analog horror genre. And while that does mean that he knows how to, you know, form an interesting and uh, understandable 
uh, analog horror story, it also comes with some of the obstacles and pitfalls and tropes that come with making analog horror. Breadsword made a really interesting video exploring this a little bit more called The Adventures of Tintin and the Shadows of Giants that I'd suggest watching. But what this means for the Mandela catalog is that because Alex is such a fan of the genre, there are times that the Mandela catalog falls back onto tropes that end up hurting the work as a whole. For instance, the use of spooky faces. I think this can be an effective horror device, but at this point, the cliche of spooky faces in the dark is so overused, it really takes a subtle and difficult balance to actually be scary. And unfortunately, a lot of the faces used so far in the Mandela catalog are, well, many of them are recognizable. For instance, the actual setup of the intruder from Mandela catalog volume one is pretty great, but then it smash cuts to this guy. Sure, he's spooky, but I've seen this guy like a million times. He comes up on the first page of Google when you search creepy police sketches. And hey, I've used it before too, I'm not saying I'd be so much better at this, but there are a lot of spooky faces used in this series that have the same effect because they're so recognizable, especially if you've been in the spooky online space for a little while. And look, okay, I know, everybody has said it already, everyone's brought it up, I know, I know, but I mean... The exception to this, I'd say, is that distorted angel character. While it's not specifically spine-chilling for me, the direct distortion of a religious figure is pretty effective, and I think with some tweaks, it could be really unique and scary. I've seen some fan art of this character that really captures the essence without playing as much into the goofiness that is now associated with face app style big smiles. There's another use of imagery, though, that is just amazing. It's the use of real-life video and photography. Now, obviously, this isn't the first analog horror series to utilize footage from real life, but many series have opted to use 3D renders, stock footage, or just straight up only using text and graphics. It's much easier for a video editor to do that than go out and record footage from real life and try to make it look convincing and scary. And again, it's not that the Mandela catalog is the only one using real life footage, but the way it's using it is really effective. There's something about the quality of these photos that really makes you feel like the story is being told in an actual physical place somewhere in the world. That image of the door by the stairs is super eerie, and the security camera sequences are always super tense. Even with very little actually going on on camera, it can pull off some really unsettling imagery. For instance, just placing a sensor bar here with the text, Victim's corpse is seen being tampered with by an invisible force gives a really creepy feeling without actually showing anything. Something about the quality of the flash, the lighting, and the actual household these photos are being taken in is really great. Same goes for all the live action footage used in the series. With that said, I want to talk a little bit more about the series outside of just the imagery. Like I said before, the Mandela Catalog's use of religious imagery and themes is actually really great. It's not just, ooh, spooky monster that's vaguely religion related. It actually uses the cultural expectations that come with religion to really build this sense of hopelessness. Now, personally, I'm not religious, but I can imagine if you were seeing this idea that this monster could not just intercept the messages of God, but actually imitate perfectly and replace him would be pretty scary. But even for someone like me that isn't religious, the cultural expectations that come with religious figures are ingrained in our brains. So when something is put on that backdrop as something that powerful and entrenched in every aspect of our culture, it seems almost completely impossible to defeat or combat. It's a hopeless venture to defeat something that is inherently more powerful than even God himself. It's very Lovecraftian to a degree in that way. And that is a huge piece of the puzzle that makes the Mandela catalog so interesting. It fully explores true hopelessness. One more subtle way they do this is introduce Mark and Caesar as victims. We know the outcome before we know anything about them. There isn't hope for them making it out. We know that it ends with them dead or worse. And as the series has gone on, it's clear we're focusing on these characters, despite knowing there's no outcome where they survive. You just have to watch in fear as these people are doomed to die. Other things like that victim's corpse is seen being tampered with by an invisible force message add to this theme of hopelessness incarnate. There is no rest or respect for the dead or victimized, and they are treated like toys by these extremely powerful beings. 
A slightly less unique, but still interestingly explored theme in the Mandela catalog centers around the doppelganger and you are your own worst enemy concepts. Plenty of media has explored it before. The thing, us, even among us. But the Mandela catalog explores another interesting aspect of this, specifically focusing on the fact that you are your own worst enemy. Not just superficially with the fear that something that looks like you is going to overtake your life and trick those around you, but more directly and personally. The alternates do not kill you directly. They drive you to kill yourself with some supernatural ability. The way to protect yourself is to never let the creatures know your fear. Their power comes from a place deep within yourself. They exploit things about you, and in the end, you die by your own hand because of your own fear that they simply exploited. The very thing that makes you, you, are the things that are your biggest weakness and their greatest strength. One last thing that they did that I think is very interesting is this whole crisis of alternates is very public. We're not talking about a government cover-up, or at least that we know, or a phenomenon that is only affecting a handful of protagonists. This is a crisis the world at large is trying to handle. It gives an odd sense of realism. 3,000 children going missing isn't going to go unnoticed. Creatures attacking and replacing people by the thousands isn't going to be easily covered up. So instead, we see how humanity tries desperately to cling to procedure and mitigation to a problem so outside of the scope of our understanding. It also explores how the systems we function under handle this problem imperfectly, or inherently leaves people behind. Most being attacked by these doppelgangers are simply left to die. We're not making a squid game capitalism point necessarily. We're just taking a more grounded approach and looking at how this sort of imperfect system that we live in tries to handle this incomprehensible threat. It, it keeps it grounded in a way. And finally, we get to talk about Exhibition, the most recent video, the finale to season one. Like I said, all of the criticism up to this point has been pre-exhibition. And let me tell you something, this video is good. And as soon as I finished watching it, I was super excited to come and start writing about it. Every criticism I had had of the previous videos and everything that I liked about them were perfectly shaped into this video along with some additions that made the experience very unique. It goes all in on its best parts of imagery and themes, using religious cartoons and church footage in a genuinely eerie way to drive home the points I've mentioned previously. It utilizes more real life footage and photos that create a sense of realism and genuine unease in many of the sequences that also adds a level of production value. The dark church, the forest roads, and the meta inclusion of a camcorder actually filming an analog television is creepy and legitimately interesting and engaging to watch. And that false prophet angel character is brought back in a less cartoony, more subtly upsetting manner that really sells the character as something to be afraid of. It's not 100% perfect, but it has me really excited to see where the Mandela catalog goes. It's a leap forward in quality from the previous videos, and it just makes me think a lot about what analog horror's future is in general, which leads me to my next section. Analog horror as a genre right now online is very saturated. And the Mandela Catalog is in no way the only one guilty of some of the criticisms I've laid out in this video. Creepy faces in the dark, uh, unsettling classical or opera music playing quietly in the background. And these tropes exist for a reason, they're creepy. But once you use them enough, you start being able to pick up on the patterns and they become less scary. It's the same reason a lot of people aren't scared by horror movie jump scares anymore. Someone hears a noise. They slowly approach where the noise came from, perhaps behind a door or a curtain. Tension builds. The person rips the curtain away to find nothing is there. The tense music stops. There's a sigh of relief. And then boom, jump scare. That's supposed to be surprising. But after the 50th time seeing that setup and punchline, much like the attack helicopter jokes, it loses even its jarring aspects and not only becomes ineffective, but just plain boring and groan inducing. Analog horror has many of these issues as well. Even to the point where I think the VHS aesthetic is on the verge of being overplayed.
What needs to happen for analog horror to continue is new creators need to come in and shake up the formula. This kind of happened with Squimpus uh, with the FNAF VHS tapes. And now a lot of those things that were in those original videos have become oversaturated in themselves. And that's not necessarily Squimpus's fault because Squimpus found a really good, effective um, setup for these types of videos. But we need more people like Alex to keep coming in and innovating and moving it further. Analog horror is very closely associated with and could arguably be a subcategory of unfiction, series that attempt to portray themselves as existing in their own canonical universe. Something like Diminish, that does fall into the This Game I Found format, sure, but is impactful and unique nonetheless, I think should be a great place to look for analog horror writers and creators. Looking outside of the fandom to see what makes other pieces of media effective can be a great way to innovate, and I hope we see more of that in the future, especially with something that has so much potential like the Mandela Catalog. Thank you all so much for watching. Shout out to Wendigoon and Alex and the whole community that is built around the Mandela Catalog. It is Super cool to see an original horror IP grow so big like this. Uh, also, you know, if you liked what you saw in this video, maybe subscribe. And uh, yeah, also follow my Twitter and Twitch and second channel and all that. Um, to vote on what I cover next, you can go to my Patreon. And uh, yeah, I'll see you all next time.